Welcome into my humble shop in Bandera, Texas. My name is Mickey Adams, and this is Pedal Steel Guitar Mechanics Volume Number One. You're listening to my good friend Buck Reed and Sourdough from his CD, A Work in Progress. I began my love affair with pedal steel guitars approximately 30 years ago. Ten years ago, I was lucky enough to have landed an endorsement deal with Mullen Pedal Steel Guitars, my favorite pedal steel guitar on the planet, the best designed pedal steel guitar in my mind, and I got to go to the factory for five days because I wanted to learn how they were constructed, the design techniques, you know, the thought process in, uh, in research and development, where the guitar was headed, and everything that I could possibly absorb in a week. On the last day, the master called me into the shop and he says, this is how we do the final tune out on the guitar. I actually was not even thinking about this, but it was a blessing because 10 to 15 minutes in, I knew exactly what he was doing. The only thing that I didn't have a handle on yet were the splits. I understand basically how they function, but not how to time them perfectly. So after 15 minutes of this, I'm dumbfounded. The first thing I do is I go home and I tear my guitar apart and I start tweaking. And you are going to make mistakes, but chances are you're not going to break anything. The pedal steel guitar is a pretty robust instrument. I mean, unless you drop something or bend it or strip a screw out or if you break something, then of course it's going to have to be repaired prior to uh, you trying to make your guitar do what it's supposed to do. But uh, in the end, for us, it's about fine tuning our instrument. The pedals and levers give us a tactile attachment to the changer. And when they're set right, the pedal steel guitar is an absolute marvel. And it's a pleasure to play, especially when it comes back into tune exactly the way it's supposed to. And we can rely on it doing exactly what it is that we want it to do. So come with me on a journey through the undercarriage of a pedal steel guitar. And by the end of this video, I promise you, you'll be ready to tear yours apart, put it back together, and I want to hear about it. So let's get started with the pull train. This is the beginning of a pull train. This is a pedal attach linkage. This is a forward stop. This is a cross shaft. This particular one is a split cross shaft, a two piece shaft. This is a lever armature. It's a attach point. This is the aspect ratio set screw for the lever itself. The purpose of the forward stop on this manufacturer's guitar is to define the forward limits of the rotational axis of the shaft. In order to limit the rotation in the opposite direction or the activated position, we use a device like this, which is called a lever stop. So we have a finite range of motion for the shaft. This may contact a striker plate. It may contact a center rail. It may contact the wood. The stop assembly is merely a Phillips head screw with a locking nut. Tension on the lever can be adjusted by this nut, which is a locking nut. In order to increase or decrease the tension for extending or retracting the lever to the travel position. The pedal linkage attaches directly to or is part of the cross shaft in some models but provides a method of attaching a pedal rod and thence a pedal at the other end for activation. This particular linkage has tolerances great enough to where it would never need lubricating. Next stop on the pedal train is the bell crank. Let's look at how the bell crank has evolved over the years. The bell crank itself's purpose, of course, is an attach point and it's a ratio device. So there have been a lot of changes to the design over the years, resulting in something just as simple as this, the beauty of simplicity. This particular puller from the 60s was made out of cheap pot metals, prone to breaking. It had to be 
put on the shaft before the shaft was put in the guitar, so you had to know the copedant before you put in the undercarriage. Uh, that's no more. It has six options for rod placement. One good thing about this puller or bell crank is that because of its width, it'd been easy to put a rod on this side and pin it and put a rod on this side and pin it and use one bell crank for two adjacent string pulls. This is a puller or bell crank from um, early 70s guitar. It only had four options for rod placement. It had a plastic Delrin uh, insert here, which had a threaded hole in it, which made things a little more difficult. You had to thread it through here. Now it has a finite travel limit here, and you had a travel limit at the changer. Uh, that's outdated, but it was functional as well. This particular puller, like this one that we just threw in the bin, each successive function for a given string had to go through each successive bell crank because of their shape. You wouldn't route around it. So if pedal A way out here had a rod pulling here and your center knee left and your uh, right knee right all had five functions, these would have had to been all lined up prior to stacking the rods in all three bell cranks. That's, that's no longer being done. Now, I can tell you from this bell crank right here, this would be your best option for timing a half stop feel. Simply because you have more tunable options. Tunable by the selection of placement of the rod. And you're gonna understand this completely very soon, I promise you. Now let's get to the modern puller or bell crank. Its attached method is quite simple. The rod is bent at a 90 degree angle. It has a hole tapped through it. Uh, the hole is uh, tapped for a cotter pin. The cotter pin basically holds it in place and it doesn't need any lubrication. It's another one of those places where we just don't need any petroleum products. So it's an attach point. Now it's a ratio device. And let's put this into layman's terms and make it quite simple. When I rotate my cross shaft via my lever or my pedal at its specified distance, we impart that information from the cross shaft directly into the changer finger. So the displacement here will be exactly the same. But the arc here and the arc here are very different. For a given rotation distance here, we wound up here with a very quick, very long pull. Longer pull, shorter pull. Here's the trade-off, more resistance, less resistance. This is the device right here that changed the world. This is a modern all-pull uh, changer finger from a guitar that I've got disassembled right now. Uh, it's from one of the top major manufacturers. Let's get to know it. The device allows for a tuned string to be lowered or raised to a predetermined pitch and return to a zero reference point. The zero reference point defines our open tuning. The effective range and rate of pitch change that a single finger may extract from a tuned string is entirely dependent on two things. The first, of course, is the tension on the string, which is determined by the pitch that it's tuned to and its diameter. Each individual finger exhibits exactly the same limits and capabilities. Spacers may be inserted in between changer fingers in order to define the string spacing on your particular guitar. The spacer may be self-lubricating material such as Delrin or aluminum. Uh, the spacer separates the fingers from one another and assures that friction between two adjacent roller heads is neutralized. The changer fingers are lined up on a shaft which forms a rigid mount from which the roller head can rotate or pivot from. The shaft and all fingers are then assembled into their respective housing, mounted into the body of the guitar. The changer should be mounted and torqued as tightly as feasible for your particular guitar, and this will be our first line of defense against cabinet drop. The finger is merely a fulcrum device. The raise and lower portions of the scissor assembly work in unison, and each one is dependent on the other. The raising and lowering arms form what we call the scissor. The scissor is riveted to the roller head, which pivots on its attach point. 
The string attaches either by the use of a pressure pin or a claw design, such as this. The number of receiver holes denotes the changer's capabilities. In this case, triple raise and triple lower. This, of course, means that we may have six functions on any given string, three of which must be raises and three of which can be lowers. So once we've cleaned and lubricated uh, our changer fingers individually and we've assembled our changer, we're now ready to insert the finished changer into the body and bolt it into place. But before we actually load the changer with string tension, we want to isolate the lower portion of the finger by attaching its return spring. Let's begin using 60 to 70 percent of the available spring tension on the lower return screws across the board. At this point, you may see the raised portion of the finger rotate to its full raised travel stop. This occurs due to the force on the lower return spring acting on an unequal pivot point between the raise and the lower scissors, and this is normal. Next, we will string the guitar and tune the guitar to pitch. Now, since the lower is isolated by the lower return spring, the string does not exert enough force to unseat the lower portion of the finger from, uh, from zero reference and subsequently rotate the roller head, which is good. That's what we want. This zero reference is our defined open tuning stop for the lower. The raised portion of the finger works in the opposite direction from the lower. As we tune the string to pitch, the raised portion of the scissor can see at its zero reference point, and now the strings can be tuned. The changer at this point is now armed. The attach point selection for our pull rods here is going to define another variable in our formula. The basic rule of thumb is shorter pulls closer to the pivot point, longer pulls longest arm from the pivot point. In order for a finger to raise a string and pitch, the lowering portion of the scissor must be immobilized. In order to lower a string and pitch, the raise must be immobilized. The dominant side of managing the tension on a string is the lower function. The lower return spring holds the roller head full aft on its zero reference stop on the finger and allows us to manage the tension. We accomplish this by the use of a lower return spring. The spring must at first, at the very least, equal the tuned string's tension in order to hold the lowering finger at its zero reference point. We must also add any increase in tension that would result from raising this string as well. Tuning a string to pitch before we immobilize the lowering scissor would merely pull the lowering portion of the finger to its full travel. At this point, the roller head would be fixed in a full travel lower position. This is our first look at what we call zero reference. In order to arm the changer, we must first anchor the lowering portion of the scissor before we add the string tension. We accomplish this by attaching the lower return spring to its attach point, which may be a retainer plate, it may be a fixed tension attachment to the end plate itself, or it may have an adjustable length screw whose anchor point is actually part of the end plate itself. We talked about the constants in the pedal steel guitar, such as the ratio and the tuners, that's a constant. 18 rotations here equals one rotation of the capstan. The changer has finite limits. The variables, of course, are our bell crank selection and our changer selection. Also, the diameter of a specific string is a variable, excuse me, is a constant. But we can change the diameter of the string and therefore change the characteristics of its tuning requirements. When we increase the tension on a string or raise it to the next graduation in our musical scale, which is a half step, we will increase its tension and we will decrease its propensity for increasing in pitch. Let me rephrase that. The farther I pull a string, the less return I get. It will take me more tension to move from this G to this G sharp than it will from this F sharp to this G. 
as the string increases in tension, it requires a longer and longer travel to make it to the next graduation. Now the opposite is true for lowering a string. As I lower a string, it requires less and less distance to get down to the next half step interval or whole step or minor third, as the case may be. So this variable is something that we're going to manage in the changer as well. Now string number three on the E9 pedal steel guitar has probably been the Achilles heel because it's only 11 thousandths in diameter, it's tuned to a very high pitch, and even though it's only going to move from G sharp to A with our pedal B activation, there's going to be a large increase in the amount of tension on the string. We are very close to the tensile strength limit, which falls right up here just short of A actually. And if we stretch the string too many times, too rapidly, we could actually find a weak spot in the string and break it. So here's my advice for restringing your guitar when it comes to string number three. Don't tune the string immediately to G sharp. Tune it to G first and activate the pedal several times. Allow the string to sit and acclimate to its new tension and stretch along its length before we ever tune it to G sharp. Do the same thing at G sharp. Let it sit for a few minutes, gently depress the pedal, tune it back to G sharp and let it sit. The whole process takes about five or six minutes and if you'll take the time to do this, nine times out of 10, your G sharp will remain on your guitar intact for the entire life of the string. We can stretch the string at the headstock with the tuner assembly or with the changer with a programmed finite amount of travel. Well, the tuner head has a finite amount of travel too for a given rotation on the head and we call that the gear ratio of course. This particular tuner's ratio is 1 to 18. So 18 turns of the tuner head will result in the capstan rotating 360 degrees exactly one time. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the difference in the pull rate from string here, number one, F-sharp, to this string at the bottom of our tuning, which is a B. What I'm going to do is introduce a finite amount of travel at the tuner head by rotating the head exactly 90 degrees. This will simulate the same thing as pulling the changer, a specified distance. Let's look at the difference between our 13 thousandths diameter F sharp string and our 36 O36 gauge B string. If I rotate the tuner head here exactly 90 degrees, my F sharp is going to move to here. It's still in between F sharp and G. It has not even made a half step movement accurately. We are somewhere between F sharp and G. The first graduation, which is a half step. Now let's look at string number 10, which is a B. Two octaves lower and is an O, uh, I think I was a 34 on this particular guitar. But I'm going to rotate this tuner head 90 degrees. Now the B string has not only made it up to the next graduation, which is the half step, C, it's actually a whole tone, but only a half step, but it's actually sharp from C, which means that it's gone probably twice as far on the average as this string did. So this string requires much less travel to do the exact same thing in a different octave than this string does. I'm now going to switch to a modern all-pull pedal steel guitar. This is a state-of-the-art instrument. It happens to be my primary stage instrument. It is the culmination of one man's life's work and I am proud to play his guitars on stage. We're going to begin here at the pedal train head with a pedal rod attach point. You can clearly see an expansion pin which protrudes from the front apron support bracket. The bracket is bolted to the front apron. The expansion pin is collared by a Delrin spacer. The Delrin spacer provides permanent lubricant to this contact point. The pedal linkage is anchored on a swivel for alignment. The pressure pin itself provides a pedal up hard stop position within its race. Behind the eyelet in the support bracket is a tap for a set screw. 
This is the pedal travel stop screw. It contacts a protruding extension that rides in its own race inside the support bracket. From there, the linkage attaches to the hexagonal cross shaft and is anchored in place by a set screw. Cross shafts are retained in the front apron by a single countersunk Phillips head screw. They are seated in a ball bearing assembly and can be serviced by removing a retainer clip on the rear apron. The bell crank has five fulcrum positions and is tapped to receive an aluminum rod at a 90 degree bend and is retained by a cotter pin tap. The reversing mechanism is streamlined and very rigid. The forward stop on this is a brass wheel which comes into contact with the body on the bottom and with the reversing linkage on the top. The changer housing in this particular design is also used to define a mounting point for a device designed to assure proper rod alignment. It also serves to define the lower ZR point. The reversing mechanism for this particular lever also utilizes a stop screw that hovers over the linkage. Here are the raised helper springs and their attach points. I will return these two levers to the undercarriage. I'm going to remove the rods and hexes for both of these functions. And uh, we are going to program this one for a double raise single lower and this one for a double lower single raise. I'm going to abandon my guide here just for a few minutes and talk freeform about potential problems that we may encounter down the road. We want to eliminate as many pitfalls and make sure that our guitar is actually ready to rod. The first culprit when it comes to changers not coming back or things not working the way they're supposed to is the cross shaft itself. It's not uncommon for older guitars, their bodies to twist over time under the immense loads that they're under, which would in turn possibly bind the shaft. It may be possible for you to take all of the stops off of the shaft, all of the functions, all of the bell cranks to where you just have the shaft and its mounts and rotate the shaft to an area where it may have a free rein to rotate far enough for us to get the functions out of it without changing anything in the guitar. However, if the shaft will not function freely, then it has to be addressed prior to us moving any further in the video. Uh, let's see, one other thing I wanted to mention is the testing of the changer itself. I want to make sure that it's capable of providing the function that I want to put on it. So I am going to go with my bolt. I'm going to start at string number one. I'm just going to demonstrate this on string one. I'm going to tune my open string to F sharp. Make sure it goes to A flat because that's as far as I need to push it. And as you can see, I've actually stretched the string farther than it's used to, so, and these are relatively new, so we may be tuning our open string every now and then, but let's try that again, because we want to make sure the changer finger reseats. The raised portion of the finger is back at ZR, no problem. Now to check the lower, we don't really need a bolt. We can do that, but we have access to the changer finger right here, so there's the F sharp. And I don't have a lower that I'm going to program here, but we want to make sure that the finger is free, of course. So we now have a stable ZR for F sharp, string number one, and we are ready to rod. The right knee left and the right knee right levers have been returned to their mounts, and before we begin the rotting process, let's eliminate some potential problems. I have a C6 function which has been disabled. Any function can be disabled simply by backing the associated hex off to take it out of play, or you can remove it altogether from the guitar. This, of course, will relieve the lever from that particular string's resistance. I'm going to make sure that my shaft is free and ready to load. I'll also check the changer capabilities with regards to my desired functions. We have just accomplished all that. So, here we go. You're about to have some gee whiz moments, I'm gonna tell you right now. These two levers will be assigned the following groups of pitch changes within the E9 tuning and we will address the following topics. The first is the primary travel stop setting for a group of pulls. Next is the half stop feel. And for this guitar, which has a fixed rod attach point, the primary hex placement procedure. 
The right knee left, string number one at 13 thousandths in diameter is an F sharp. We will raise this string a whole tone to G sharp. We will supplement this change by timing another string to contact its changer finger to coincide with string number one reaching the half step en route to its whole step stop. This is how a half stop feel is created. String number two, a 15 thousandths in diameter string, is going to go up a half step from D sharp to E. Its travel requirements will be much less than string number one's due to its tension and its diameter. Rotting this particular model guitar with a fixed attach point to the bell crank can be accomplished by pinning the rods into our chosen bell crank positions, then inserting the rods into the changer while simultaneously seating the bell crank to its respective cross shaft. Once the rods have been attached, we'll incorporate an aluminum barrel spacer that is slightly larger than the rod diameter, and this spacer will give us a rigid and precise contact point to the finger, and the hex nut will be used to determine the length of the rod that will move through the changer finger. Okay, hex placement procedure. Here's the sequence. First, my bell crank is securely fastened to my cross cross shaft with the following formula. String number one, bell crank number four, changer number three. Longest pull, next to longest pull, uh, rather short pull, but the same ratio in the changer. No problem. The question may arise, can I just change this? Yes, you can always change this, but you have to change this. See, that's the key. It's the stop screw. This is what most people don't understand. So, we're about to have a gee whiz moment, guys, I'm telling you right now. Okay, you see all the slack in the train right here. Let me get back to my notes. Next, we're gonna remove all of the slack in the lever train completely. And you can do this just by wiggling it, or you can look at your tuner, because what's gonna happen is, when this lever is pulled all the way to its forward stop, which is a definable stop, the hex has no choice but to start pushing the changer finger in. It's gonna unseat the changer from ZR, and you're gonna see the string go sharp. My tender's not registering here. Let's see if this is a little better. There we go. And you can hear the F sharp starting to go sharp. Next, we're gonna go back to the zero slack. So when the string comes back to pitch, now the hex and spacer are right up against the changer finger. There is no slack in the train at all. So at this point, it's actually bound. It'll function, but you're going to activate immediately as soon as you breathe on this lever. We don't want that, we want just a little bit of slack. So once we've come back to our zero slack position, we're now gonna give it about a turn, maybe a turn and a half. And we can see the slack on the lever and that's perfect. Okay, this is going to assure us of two things. One, the string is absolutely gonna come back to ZR when I let it go because it's got that little bit of slack in it, right? The second is that this little bit of slack may compensate for minor inconsistency in string diameters, uh, which can and do actually occur in the manufacturing process. It also means that if a breakage occurs and we don't have the exact gauge strings, we may be able, uh, we may have enough slack at this point to accommodate a temporary replacement string uh, without having to change the stop. So with that in mind, uh, if string one was replaced with a smaller diameter string, then the travel required would increase. But if you replaced it with a larger diameter string, it doesn't need as much travel to go for, to the next graduation. So it will pull much faster. So it will require less travel, okay? Now congratulations are in order. This is the hex placement procedure. Now, I wanna see where my pedal stop is tuned. Well, it doesn't get to A flat. I'm not gonna touch my hex again. I need this slack. So now the responsibility for getting string number one from F sharp to G sharp is the function now of the stop screw. All I have to do is set the stop screw to where the string will go move to G sharp. And I did it by ear actually. I'm unlucky. I've done enough of these to where I'm pretty in tune with what it's going to require as far as mo movement goes. But now, look at that. Oh, it's actually a little sharp. You know what? I'll just take it out and slack. There you go. A flat. G whiz. That is how you set 
the lever stop. Now, a paddle stop and a lever stop are exactly the same thing. Our set screw down here, all it does is exactly what this does. It limits the rotation of the shaft, but it does it on the pedal. So the pedal stop for string one is now correctly set for these bell crank and changer positions that we've selected. So we'll test the function for excessive movement or tension, and we will adjust these locations as necessary to suit us. So if you prefer to change the fulcrum position in the bell crank and changer, first back the hex nut several turns, allowing ample slack on the rod, uh, unpin the rod, make the timing change here. Then execute the hex placement procedure again, and note that the stop screw must be recalibrated. Since we have a different ratio with the bell crank and changer, then we need to reset the stop screw. We're now ready to introduce the second function to our right knee left, and that is going to be a raise on string number two from D sharp to E. At this point, we have a smooth, uniform feedback and tactile properties from the activated lever. When we put the second function on a different diameter string, traveling a shorter distance, and tune its hex nut, here's what occurs. This second string requires less than half of the travel that string number one's primary stop is set to. Therefore, you can literally pick almost any fulcrum points and install the second rod wherever you see fit. But the location that you select will determine where along the shaft rotation the second string will reach its zero slack point and begin to unseat its raised finger from its ZR. At this point, tension on the lever will increase due to the load increase of the second pull. This increase in resistance at the lever fulcrum is known as a half stop feel. Where the feel occurs can be altered by changing the bell crank changer selections of string number two. This in turn will determine where the feel will reside in relation to string one's arrival at G. One note that I want to add here before we move on is that when we place more functions on this particular cross shaft, if you place another function on the shaft and select a very, very short throw, the change may or may not fall within the current pedal stop setting. It will manifest itself in the following manner. When we tune our stop and release the lever or pedal and the ZR has been compromised on that specific string, you have two choices. You can either make this the travel stop candidate or you're going to have to choose a quicker, longer throw on your bell crank changer positions. Either one will suffice as long as the tension and the travel suit your requirements. I'm now going to switch guitars for the string two, string nine, right knee right changes, which will include the string two half stop feel. This guitar's bell cranks have a cinch type connector, so we can look at the hex placement procedure from a slightly different angle. Also, the pedal stop setting is reversed due to a fixed down stop on this particular model. This is opposite, of course, from my personal stage guitar. I'm now going to set the travel and half stop feel for my right knee right. I have not chosen the longest fulcrum point on the second string's bell crank, but on this particular guitar, I will still utilize the same bell crank and changer locations on both strings. And for guitars that don't have splits, this usually works out pretty well. The split, by the way, will allow us to precisely tune this D half stop on string number two. It'll also allow us to decrease some of the tension, and we'll get into that in the last chapter. String two requires roughly four times the travel that string number nine's half stop lower does. So the first thing we will do is HPP string two, that's hex placement procedure, and we'll set its travel stop. I'm gonna go ahead and detune the travel stop, and I have the following formula. I have string number two, and out of a five hole bell crank, I have bell crank number three and changer number six. So we have a three and three changer, three lowers, three raises. So I have the longest travel in the changer, but I have kind of a mid-level, more than mid-level travel in the, uh, as a fulcrum position on the bell crank. So the first thing that I want to do after cinching the rod is to place the slack, the one and a half turns of slack in. So we can go about this two ways. The first way, 
would be to just push the rod through to the cinch and tighten it with the rod at zero slack. So the bell crank would be pulled right up against the changer when we cinch it. You can either do that and then back it off a turn and a half here to get our play, or you can just eyeball it to begin with, uh, pull the rod all the way up to zero slack so the hex is touching the changer, and back it off just a couple of millimeters and then cinch it down. And then we can look here to see that we have a few millimeters of play. This assures us that the string comes back to zero reference point. At this point, we only have one string connected to the changer. I've actually already placed the rod for string number nine, but I'm going to back the hex way off so it doesn't come into play. So we have a smooth tactile transition from a static position here to the full activated position. I have my little bit of slack here, so I am now ready to set my travel stop. Let's take a look at our open string D sharp, and that looks good. Let's see where the travel stop is set. Way low, all the way down to C. So let's move the travel screw up closer to the armature. And we'll continue doing this until our lever is tuned at C sharp. And once we find our C sharp, Okay, our travel is set for string number two. We are good to go. Let's lock down that screw. We'll check it again. There we go. Zero reference D sharp, dead on the money. Dead on the money C sharp. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to tune string number nine. So remember, I have placed the hex uh, on string number nine in position number six, bell crank number three, and string number nine. So nine, three, six. And now all I have to do is tune my ninth string. There's my D. D comes back to zero reference, no problem, and tunes to C sharp. It's, it's wavering a little bit, but we'll tune that out uh, when we fine tune at the end. We're close enough for government work here. Okay, what we have now done is introduced a second function. So the second function is basically going to come into play right here. You can see that string number two is going to unseat from ZR right here, and at this point where we feel the half stop feel, this is where hex number nine comes up to the changer and meets at zero slack point. Any further increase, and we're going to increase the tension because we have a second spring that's in play. But what we want to look at is where does the D fall and look how sharp it is. Okay, so let's think about this a minute. The D is sharp, so I basically need the lever to go farther. Right? I need the lever to come down here before D activates. So somehow the hex has got to back up away from the changer. Well, how can we time this to where we can back it up? That's quite simple. We need a faster pull. So what I'm going to do is now I am going to uncinch the rod on string number nine, and I'm going to move it to the next longest fulcrum point. We're now going to have the formula string number nine, bell crank number four, and changer number six. Now remember, the fulcrum points in the bell crank can be changed as well as the ones in the changer, and there will be a slight difference between the two. Now that I've changed this location here, I'm going to have to retune string nine because its timing is completely different. So let's check our zero reference for our open string. That looks good. And we need a C sharp, correct? Major difference there, you see that? Of course, I uncinched it, and this, the hex placement procedure is so different here because we're cinching here uh, that uh, we have to go back and return, retune this each time. Now, there's our C sharp. Now let's see where D falls. It's still, still slightly sharp, okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's move up to the absolute longest pull. Now, all we're doing here, guys, is we're experimenting. We're seeing what the change in timing, how it affects 
where string number two reaches D and string number nine comes into play. Same thing again. I know this is going to require a lot of slack, so I'm going to go ahead and put, put some slack in here. Okay, cinch it down. Okay, back to my tuning nut and tune string number nine. Look how it's all the way down to B now. Here we go, getting close. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to a, a different changer position. I'm going to go back to bell crank number three, and I'm going to move down to changer hole number five. I'm going to go ahead and put some slack in there and cinch. Okay, and now I'm going to check my D again. There we go. And I am going to tune string number nine. It's C sharp pull. Okay, D comes down to C sharp, so let's see here. We're slightly out of tune, let's get that. Okay, there we go. And let's check our tuning on string number nine. Now, let's see where D falls on string number two. Just a few cents sharp. Not bad. Okay, let's move up. Let's speed it up a little bit. Let's move up another bell crank. So all we're doing here is we're experimenting. Where is, where is the half stop feel going to fall when it comes to the timing on string number nine? Because string number nine's hex reaching the changer in zero slack is the point at where the half stop feel is recognized. Okay, let's retune our D. It's string number nine, C sharp. Looking good. Now, let's see where D falls. Oh, look at that, we nailed it. We now have D dead on the money. So here, there's a perfect half stop timed. Here's the timing. We have, let's see, string number two. We have bell crank number three, changer number six. String number nine, we have bell crank number four, changer hole number five. And when we tune everything out, we can actually take this down just a little bit more. There we go. On the money, on a little sharp. That's actually going to get, even get us closer. There we go. We are right on the money. Now that is how we time a half stop feel. Bet you thought it was rocket science, didn't you? So now let's do a little bit of review. Our guitar's undercarriage had been vacated and cleaned. We checked all of our shafts for free rotation. We tightened all of the screws that we could find on this thing everywhere. The changer may or may not have been cleaned and lubricated, removed from the guitar, but it is reinstalled in the housing and it's been mounted. The lower return springs have been anchored and tightened to approximately 70% travel. All of the lever stop screws have been loosened. The tuner heads have been tightened gently, but not so much as to crush the Delrin spacer in between the tuner head uh, and the housing. The roller nut was free, and the guitar had been cleaned and restrung to pitch. That fully arms the changer. Now that most of the confusing things are behind us, what I'd like to do is reinforce what we have already learned by introducing a very simple procedure, and that will be timing a standard A pedal. This should be child's play for most of us at this point, but there is a fundamental difference in this guitar stop settings I'd like to point out. Uh, note that the down stop is predefined here and is non-adjustable, but the reversing stop is accomplished by a set screw, and the set screw is in the linkage right here, and it has a screw which comes into contact with the body. This will define the distance from here to the fixed stop which in turn will change our pedal height, and of course it will move our hexes either farther or closer uh, to ZR or uh, zero slack. 
but this doesn't really present a problem. Here's how we're going to deal with that. First, of course, we're going to HPP string number five, and we're going to set its travel limits. Okay, I've chosen the following formula: uh, five two three uh, ten one three as my formula. And one thing to remember is that almost any formula will work as long as you allow the shaft to rotate far enough to accommodate the string that requires the longest travel. So I'm going to reposition the camera so we get the right shot and we are going to install pedal A. Okay, now we're ready to set up pedal A. 5, 2, 3, 10, 1, 3 is my formula. And the first thing I want to do is the hex placement procedure. Well, let's just go ahead and take out all the slack and let's, let's find our, where we unseat from ZR. And there we are right there, unseated. Okay, I am going to come back to zero slack. Now turn in a half of play. I'll check the play here. That's all exactly the same, correct? Now, let's see where our pedal goes. It's really close. As a matter of fact, I can just take out a little turn here and boom, I'm dead on the money. So I have zero reference, solid as a rock. I have my stop at C-sharp, solid as a rock. And next, all I have to do is tune string number 10. Now, if I need more travel on the lever, I'm merely going to back this set screw out here to increase the distance between the linkage contact point and the fixed down stop. Say hello to guitar number four uh, in the video. This is an Infinity Double Ten. It has eight pedals and nine levers, and of course, it has a split changer. You can see that I have my wrench here uh, ready to go. And uh, a few notes before we actually get into my dialogue. Uh, my tuner is set to an EQU, is an equal temperament tuning. Uh, and I did this on purpose because we have so many different tempered tunings now. And my guitar is actually in tune with itself. My fourths and fifths are good. So if you see a little bit of wavering here, let's, we're not going to split hairs. We really don't need to do that at this point. So you may see the, the wheel rolling when we actually say it's in tune slightly. But it's only going to be a few cents. Okay, here we go with a split. Hopefully, guys, this is going to clear everything up. So... The most misunderstood setting on your pedal steel guitar, without a doubt, has got to be the split. A split requires two things. It must have a raise and a lower on the same string. One must be a whole step, the other must be a half step. Our objective is to get the note in between those two. The lowest lower on any string that is split is tuned at the split screw. The split screw is merely a finite stop that will contact the roller head. The lower will need to have enough travel to go several cents lower than the hex would normally take it on a guitar without the split. Otherwise, the split would not be tunable. Well, knowing what we know now about string dynamics, try and follow this logic as we look at the travel requirements for a split on string six, which is a G sharp, to be lowered a whole step to an F sharp and have the B pedal bring it back up exactly a half step to G. My right knee left is the function which will lower the string a whole step. My B pedal will raise it back up a half step. But we have our B pedal's hex tuned to exactly A. I'm sitting in an awkward position on my guitar. Okay. Now follow me. When we lower six a whole step, we change the tension and therefore its resistance. So less travel is required to get to the next half step. So where do you think B is gonna go when I step on the B pedal after the string has already been lowered? It doesn't require near as much travel to come up a half step, so it's gonna be way sharp from G. Well, here's where the confusion sets in, and I certainly understand why, because we're going to remedy this in a way that seems backwards to most people. We're working with our right knee left function, which has a one string whole tone, two string half tone, and a six string whole tone lower. The pedal stop or travel screw is set to, for string one's travel requirements. 
So therefore, string six at the longer fulcrum points in our bell crank and changer is gonna have a ton of slack on it. And we're gonna use that slack to tune the split. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce about 20 cents flat. So I got a turn and a half on my wrench here. The next thing I'm gonna do is stop the string at F sharp with my split screw. There, now technically I will from now on tune this G sharp lower with the split screw. The lowest lower on any string that has a split tuning has got to be tuned at the split screw. Now I introduced a turn and a half more tension on the hex on string number six. Let's see if that affected the B pedal. There's my F sharp. It's in tune with this one. That's all we really need. So now watch this. Well, it's still slightly sharp, but look how much closer to G it is. That's only the turn and a half of slack here that we actually introduced into the lowering finger after it had already been unseated from zero reference. And we have a ton of slack to play with. So there's my lower, that hits the split screw. There's my B pedal. String sixes lowering hex tunes the combination. So now all I want is that. I want that G. Now I'd like to discuss my favorite split on the guitar. I call it the CD split. I am going to depress pedals B and C. And most of us know what B and C do. If you don't, we've created a minor triad. So we're gonna bring four and five up a, a whole step. Then the B pedal is gonna bring up three and six a half step. And along with string number eight and seven, it's gonna give us this, which is a minor triad, right? There's the split. And this creates a plus chord or an augmented chord. And again, I'm on EQU, but I'm in tune with myself. Stay with me on this one. The lowest lower on any string that has a split tune must be tuned at the split tuner. Well, since our E string is our pedal stop candidate in our group of four and eight, and we have set it as if we did not have splits, we will not be able to activate this split unless we increase the lower travel on lever D. So if we set it without the split for minimal travel and we have the proper tension and it's comfortable to us, we are going to have to have a longer travel on that lever in order to facilitate this change. The reason is quite simple. If we set it with minimal slack to lower from E to D sharp, that's perfect. But if we're gonna split it, we're gonna be lowering it from F sharp down to F. Higher tension string, longer requirement for the lower. So, let's say that we don't reset our pedal stop. Here's how it's gonna manifest itself in our guitar. And this will reinforce everything that we've talked about all the way back to the very beginning about travels and distances on the strings. You might try this on your guitar that does not have splits. <laughs> Simply engage the B and C pedals, engage your D lever, and tune your E lowering hex until that comes down to F. What you'll find is when you release the lever, you will now have unseated the changer from ZR. Summing up the split tuning, the strings that are lowered and then raised will not require a travel increase over and above the normal hex placement procedure and pedal stop settings. However, strings that are raised and then lowered will need to have their respective travels increased in order to accommodate the longer travel requirements of the raised string. If the string in question is not the travel stop candidate in the group, chances are there will be plenty of available travel for both the raises and the lowers, such as string 10 plus the vertical. If the string in question is 
the pedal stop candidate, it will need to be timed effectively to lower the raised string. Let's now review all of the changes that I've programmed onto this modern Infinity guitar. Beginning with string number one, I have a half step feel from F sharp to G and then up to G sharp. String number two has a half step feel which is tunable and goes down to C sharp. String number three has only the B pedal. String number four comes up with the C pedal and is split with the D lever. String number five comes up with the A pedal and is split with the vertical. String number five is also split at the C pedal's five string raise. String number six has a staggered left knee left which raises it a minor third, a whole step and a half step. Upon release, my right knee left can move it down to a half step feel, a whole step lower, or a tunable split with my B pedal. String number seven comes up a half step with a feel on up to the whole step. String number eight is not split. String number nine is tuned with a split screw and it's half stop interval. String number 10 goes up a whole step and comes back down a half step with my vertical. If your modern all pull pedal steel guitar has a split changer, more than likely you can time or split every single one of these changes on your guitar as well. No maintenance video would be complete unless we had to talk about lubricants and cleaners and of course we all have our favorites. Uh, I've had very, very good luck with this group of uh, components. So let's talk about removing the changer from your guitar. I know that most of you are probably still apprehensive about removing all of those screws and actually pulling the changer out, worried that a spring is going to go across the room, and that's it. We're going to have to send our guitar across the country to have it repaired. And in most cases, this just isn't true. Nine times out of 10, I don't have to actually take the changer finger down to the individual components in order to effectively clean the changer and prep it for lubing and put it back in. Penetrating lubricants such as this one, Nuts Off, can effectively clean or liquefy everything in the changer, allowing you to flush it out basically with water and, uh, and then lubricate it. So here's my procedure. I'll take a dirty changer out, the first thing I'll do is generally spray something like this gun scrubber in just to get some of the, uh, the stuff that's still liquid and hadn't calcified out uh, and make the job a little easier for, uh, for this, for nuts off. But uh, I'll take as much out as I can simply with uh, ether based or uh, mineral spirits based liquids. But uh, this stuff will basically eat everything in the changer. It'll eat it right back down to the metal. It's very caustic, so I suggest that you wear gloves and use it outdoors because the fumes are pretty nasty too. It has a pretty foul odor. So I will spray the changer with a generous amount of this, let it sit for about 15 minutes. Then I will take a high pressure water hose and flush all of these contaminants out before I ever bring the changer back into the shop. Um, so after that, there's still a lot of moisture in the changer and I want to remove all of that. I'll use a gun scrubber. This is available at Walmart. Uh, three years ago, it was about $3 a can. Now it's about $15 a can because it says gun on it. Yeah, that's right. But this will uh, dry the changer out. I also like to heat up a sonic cleaner with some degreaser and water up to about 170 degrees and allow the changer to just sit uh, for approximately 20 minutes to remove anything that I can't see. And then once it comes out of the sonic cleaner, I will spray it down again with gun scrubber to make sure I get all the water uh, out. Now, we basically have a bone dry, bare metal changer, and then we're going to add the lubricant. So over the years, there have been many threads on what is the best lubricant for pedal steel guitars, and I have mine as well. It's non-petroleum based. This is Exxon 2380 or Mobile Jet 2 turbine engine oil. 
Either one of these are fine. The only difference in MobileJet and Exxon 2380 is, I believe, it's dye and paraffin levels. Paraffin, of course, is a wax. It's a lubricant itself, but it will calcify over time. It takes years, but this is why some of the 40s, 50s, and 60s guitars, you, it's not unusual for you to find a changer that's bound, is because that's all we had to use back then. There were no synthetics. Uh, we basically had petroleum lubricants, and that was about it. So three-in-one oil is basically what went in your guitar. Exxon 2380 and Mobile Jet 2 are very light synthetic uh, turbine engine oils. They are absorbed easily into the changer. They will never turn black. Uh, they can be used very, very sparingly. And of course, having a needle bottle is essential. Believe it or not, these things can be rather hard to find, and when you do find them, they're relatively expensive. Uh, you can write uh, Mullen Guitars, at sales at Mullen Guitars, I think they still sell. Uh, and it, they use sewing machine type oil, and it's basically very close to Mobile Jet. But the question is, where can I get Mobile Jet oil? Well, any metropolitan airport that has a runway of 5,000 feet or more will probably have a facility on the field which will serve corporate airplanes, turboprops, and business jets. Uh, Atlantic Aviation and Signature Flight Support are two of the largest chains. Uh, a quart of this oil is generally $22 to $25, and a can of this will last you uh, virtually forever. For lubricating changers that are where I'm not going to actually disassemble the guitar, I'll use something like this with a long hose on it. Of course, it's a good idea to have some uh, CFC-free electro contact cleaner as well for switches and uh, potentiometers for tone controls, of course. And, of course, the most important tool for us to have is is a good drill with the proper bits for the removal of hex nuts and screws and for us placing our strings on our guitar again. The tension on our adjustable lower return springs was originally set to approximately 70 to 80 percent of their available tension. This will assure us that as we're setting up the guitar and tuning our stops that we have ample force to keep the scissors seated at ZR. I'm going to back off the spring on string number nine and notice that when I do that after activation string number nine's scissor, the lowering portion of the scissor, does not come back to ZR. This is actually going to result in a false open tuning. So if we had not seen this in our setup, we would now be tuning string number two up to get it to its D sharp. And as we pull the finger back into position, it would act as a raise, since it's in a lowered position here, it would act as a raise, and now string number two would be sharp, in which case we would be caught in a loop, and we would be detuning and unseating and retuning and unseating, and it's a never-ending tuning issue. The issue is actually quite simple. Since there's not enough spring tension to reseat string number nine at ZR, we have no choice but to increase the tension until it does. It's now effectively seating. But any excessive tension now on the springs becomes a deficit with regards to resistance management across the board, and it will affect the guitar's tactile feel and playability. So now let's see if using the lower return springs that we can strike a suitable balance. Let's begin by checking string number two, which is the primary stop candidate for the right knee right group. The tension on spring number two is the first resistance that we encounter when the lever activates. If there's excessive tension encountered as we unseat string two from ZR, we can limit it here. Too little tension will eventually result in an imprecise, mushy feel. We need only find a suitable balance between the two. The tension that is required for precise activation of any razor lower will always be hinged on the freedom of the upstream components along the train, especially the cross shaft. Too much tension on this spring could possibly cause the raised finger to unseat when the lower is activated. This is due to the different scissor pivot points between the raise and the lower and will negate the function altogether. 
Lubrication should be used sparingly and only on metal-to-metal -metal contact points. The need for excessive lubrication and string tensions usually points to an issue upstream in the train. The raised helper spring is designed to preload a raised finger with an adjustable amount of torque. Guitars that are heavily populated with multiple functions can quickly run into unmanageable resistance levels. The lower return spring, at least, is adjustable, and on this guitar, the raised helper spring is as well. We'll use these two settings to find a suitable balance between the two. Overpopulating your undercarriage can introduce a plethora of issues. The first, of course, would be finding suitable clearance for the rods. Bending rods to route around hardware or to address the changer's receiver holes head-on should only be done as a last resort. I've set string 2's spring tension to a suitable position. Next to come in play is string number 9. When its hex reaches ZS or zero slack, we will feel the load from string number 9's return spring. Tightening this ninth spring would serve to more clearly define the half stop as the resistance level will increase. But our primary concern at this point is that string nine spring will reset the lowering finger at ZR. We can always back this one out and make a sizable difference in the full throw activation forces. Okay, this is, believe it or not, we're going to go right back to the very beginning of the pull train at the very end of the video. This is the last thing that I do for every guitar that leaves my shop. I sit down and play it myself and make sure that it fits me ergonomically. Some of us may have handicaps, some of us may have um, missing limbs, uh, we may have missing digits. Uh, so there's a lot of different variables that can come into play when it comes to the activation of the pedals. A gentleman came to me approximately five years ago with a guitar that he just could not play in tune. It was a Mullen Royal Precision. Fine guitar, fine sounding guitar, but he just could not play it in tune. I come to find out that somebody had swapped the rods, uh, so the E lower was originally over here on the right side and they had switched it over here to the left and they didn't reset the pedal stops. Not only that, but the pedal heights were all wrong. When we step on two pedals together, our objective is to go from open to closed. We don't want to be open and halfway open and, and then close up the, the cord. We want it to reach exactly in tune at the same time, and that means that our foot goes squarely down on two pedals. The A and B together and the B and C together. Now, it doesn't matter what tuning you have on your guitar. If you have pedals that are side by side, they need to reach the bottom at the same time for you to effectively go from open to closed and have all of those intervals be in tune at exactly the same time. Well, given what we know about travels now, longer travel, right? The B string, G sharp, very short. So that one's obviously gonna sit up above the B pedal slightly. And the C pedal falls just about in between the two of them. Now this formula basically works on most all pull guitars, but I encourage you to tweak these until they feel ergonomically perfect to you. This is our last line of defense in making sure that our guitar plays in tune. Well, we made it to the end of the video. Congratulations. It is my sincere hope that you will take enough away from this video alone to effectively get into the undercarriage of your pedal steel guitar, make the necessary adjustments, repairs, or improvements. Chances are if you have a guitar that's 20, 30, 40 years old, it's had many, many owners and many, many tinkerers. So setting the pedal travels and making sure that everything is adjusted properly should not be an issue for you. However, it's impossible for me to cover every potential topic when it comes to such a complex instrument. So I am available, jetdriver106 at gmail. That particular email is set up just for questions associated with this video. You can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Twitter, and of course, I'm loitering around the Steel Guitar Forum. My name is Mickey Adams, and we'll see you right back here with your pedal steel guitar.